Okay, so everything that we've been learning kind of accumulates here. We're going to, we want to now apply all of our knowledge of the first and the second derivative and apply it to practical situations where we want to find maximums and minimums of a box that we could make or a cylinder or a, all sorts of different shapes and things that we could deal with. So a lot of the time in these questions, the first part is you have to try and develop the equation that you're going to use. So that can often be a little bit of a challenge. And each question will be slightly different. So you have to be able to think on the spot a little bit and you'll have to be able to adjust. So let's have a look at this first one. We have a 10 centimeter by seven centimeter rectangular piece of cardboard that has equal square corners with a side of X. Okay, so you can see in the flat version of the diagram, you can see the X there, but you may want to come and put that over here on the 3D version. That means when I fold up the edges, my rectangular prism is going to have a height of X. Uh, what I'm trying to find is the maximum volume, let's use the highlighter instead of the pen, the maximum volume of the box. So I'm going to need an equation that involves the volume and we know from probably year seven or eight that the volume of a rectangular prism can be found with the formula LBH, length times breadth times height. I know the height is X, but what is the other dimensions of my rectangular prism? If it is 10 centimeters across this whole side here, but I'm folding X up on that side, and I'm folding X up on that side. 10 minus 2X. 10 minus 2X, excellent. I'm gonna make that this one here on the front. 10 take away 2X, because I'm folding the X up on either end. Similarly, if I have seven centimeters here, and I fold up X, and I fold up X, this one's going to be seven take away 2X. So now, I have a side length for my length, my breadth, and my height. And I'm going to sub them into my formula here for volume. So volume equals my length. I'm going to put the X first. It doesn't matter the order that you put these brackets in, but it's nice to have the X out the front. Times the breadth, which I'm going to make the 10 take away 2X, times the height, which is 7 take away 2X. Now, I'm trying to find a maximum, which means I'm going to need to differentiate this. We can differentiate single brackets, but not really three things. We could do a product if there was two. So we're gonna to have to expand this out. Will be the easiest way to do this. So I'm going to leave my X out the front and expand my two brackets there first. So 10 times seven makes 70. 10 times the negative 2x will make negative 20x. Negative 2 times 7 will make negative 14x. And negative 2 times negative 2 will make a positive 4, but I also had x's there, so that will be 4x squared. Okay, I'm going to keep expanding until I've got everything expanded out. So I want to times my x into that bracket now. So that's going to be 70 times the X. The middle two terms can actually collect up. So minus 20 X minus 14 X would be negative 34 X. But when I times it with another X from the front, it would be negative 34 X squared. Then I also have the x times the 4x squared, which would be 4x cubed. Now, that is perfectly fine like that, but often we like to have our polynomials in descending powers of x. So, probably better to rewrite the equation with the 4x cubed first, minus 34x squared, plus 70x. Okay, so there is an equation that represents the volume of that box. Now I need to find where that's going to be a maximum. To find turning points of any kind, we need to find the first derivative and make it equal to zero. So that's going to be V dash or DV over DX, if you want to use the longer version. 
Timesing the 3 with the 4, I would get 12x squared. Second term, 2 times minus 34 is minus 68x. And differentiating 70x, I will just get 70. Um, to make it easier for myself, I could factorise out a 2 from there, which would be 6x squared minus 34x plus 35. Okay, so I've differentiated. Now, I want that derivative to be equal to 0. So that means the 2 bracket 6x squared minus 34x plus 35 needs to be equal to 0. The 2 that I have factorised out the front there, you can just divide that straight away. It's not going to have any effect on the turning points. So I need to find the solutions to that quadratic that is in there. So we could try to times the 6 with the 35 and try to find some factors in there, but there is, actually isn't any. So you could use a discriminant if you are unsure. We actually have to go to the quadratic formula. So using the quadratic formula, we get x equals, please make sure you're writing small, there is quite a bit to this question. These are long questions. x equals, quadratic formula is minus b, so the minus 34 will become a plus 34, plus or minus square root of b squared is negative 34 squared minus 4 times a, which is 6, times c, which is 35, all over 2a, which is 2 times 6. Now, if we were trying to see if this was going to stay exact, I would work out what is underneath that square root sign, and it comes out to be 316. And unfortunately, the square root of 316 is not a nice number, which is why we have to go to decimals. So if you sub those into your calculator, the first solution that you will get if you do 34 plus square root of 316 over 12 will be 4.3. I'm just doing one decimal place for these. And the second solution is 1.3. Oh, I did two decimal places for that one. I guess I should do 1.4. I did 1.35 on my notes. Okay, all right. Now, we have two possibilities here, but they may not be maximums. I need to know which one is the maximum. So we have two methods for that. We can either use our table of slopes or we can use our second derivative. Now, we're going to be doing quite a few of these today, so I'm going to do a table of slopes for starters, just to refresh your memory on that one, and then we'll do the other method as well in some of our other questions, okay? All right, so to remind you of the table of slopes, you have the three rows. We have x as our top row. We need our derivative, which is going to be v dash for our second row. And we need the slope for the last row. Our two points that we have found need gaps around them in our table. So the smaller one is the 1.4. And then the larger one is 4.3. So picking some values, some nice whole numbers to sub in around them. Less than 1.4, I went to zero. Yes, excellent. Two, yes, fits nicely between there. And then five above the 4.3. So the obvious ones, the, the x values that I found at 1.4 and 4.3, my derivative should be zero. That's why we found them which means the slope is a flat horizontal line. Then there's a whole lot of calculator practice, subbing each of those numbers into the derivative, which I can't actually see on my screen right now. There it is. So I need to sub it back into, possibly that one might be the easy one. Okay, sub it into there. Does anyone want to try that? You just want me to give you the answers. All right, okay. So if you sub zero in, that's it. You should be able to do that one. Sub zero in, you get 70. Okay, if you sub 2 in, you should get negative 18. If you sub 5 in, you will get 30. So for slope, the positive 70 means we're sloping uphill, negative 18 is downhill, and a positive 30 is uphill again. So we can see our turning point, so this one is going up and over, so that one there is a maximum. 
And this one is going down and then up. So that one there is a minimum. So this one, not the one I'm after. That one is the one I'm after. So for, to write out my conclusion of what I found, I'm going to say, therefore, the maximum is when x is equal to 1.4. However, just go back and check the question. It says, what is the maximum volume? I haven't actually found the volume. I found the x coordinate where the maximum is. If I want to know what the maximum volume is, I have to sub that x value back up into my original volume equation, this one. Okay, so subbing, one last little bit to do. I need my maximum volume will be at 4 times by the 1.4 cubed minus 34 times 1.4 squared plus 70 times 1.4. And I did keep more decimal places, so it might come out slightly different, but 42.4 centimetres cubed. Um, which means the dimensions of the box. What is the maximum volume and what are the dimensions, it says. So X is 1.4. So if you put those measurements back into your diagram up, oh, my diagram, there it is. Okay, so this one here is 1.4. This one here is going to be 7 minus 2 lots of 1.4. This one's going to be 10 minus 2 lots of 1.4, and you get the three different dimensions of your rectangle. Okay, so they should come out to be... The dimensions are 1.4... Uh, it was centimetres, wasn't it? Yes, centimetres by 4.3 centimetres by 7.3 centimetres. So, yep, sorry. Can you explain the dimensions again? Yep, so we, remember we found out that the x value that we wanted was 1.4 because that was the one that was our maximum. <laughs> so what I did was I came back, came back up to my diagram here. This is the x, so that height there is the 1.4. And if I sub the 1.4 into here for x as well, so I do 7 minus 2 lots of 1.4 and it will tell me the length of that side. And I do 10 minus 2 lots of 1.4 it will tell me the length of that side. Now, what you will find with these questions, and I might have even done it in that one there, if you do too much rounding, you will find that you will get slightly different answers to the back of the book. So it is best if you can try and keep a few decimal places and save your rounding to closer to the end of the question. All right? Yes? Yeah. All right, let's try it again. These are the good ones. Question two. A certain cylindrical soft drink can is required to have a volume of 250 centimetres cubed. Show that the height of the can is 250 over pi r squared. Sometimes they do this in HSC a fair bit. If you get stuck on an earlier part of a question, if they've actually given you these parts, you can still progress through to the other stages of the question. Um, so they're giving you that to show that that's the answer that you should get, but you still have to do the steps to show how to get that equation. If you can't get that equation though, you do know that you can still keep going on to the other parts. Yeah? Because you do know what the answer should be. So, the volume of a cylinder, what is the formula? 2 pi r squared. Uh, you're closer. Pi r squared h, no 2. Pi r squared h is the area of the circle, pi r squared, times by the height of the cylinder. Okay, so I want to get the h by itself, and I also know that the volume is 250. So let's put volume is 250 equals pi r squared h. And to get the h by itself, all I'm doing is taking this pi r squared and I'm going to divide it under the, under the other side of the equation. So it will be 250 on the top and I divide the pi r squared and we're done. We've got what we needed to get. See, there it is right there. Okay, step two. 
show that the total surface area, okay, so now we're going on to surface area, is given by 2 pi r squared plus 500 over r. Now, Ben, this is probably what you were trying to tell me before, the formula for the surface area, which they're just calling S, probably in year 10 we would call it SA, surface area, but there's one letter, S for surface area, is the um, two circles, which is the 2 pi r squared, correct? Plus the circumference of a circle times the height. Yeah. So that's the one you're thinking of before. But we only want to have the surface area in terms of one pronumeral. We don't want to have R and H in here. We want to be able to get rid of the H so that we're going to be able to differentiate the surface area in terms of the radius, which is why we did this. So what we can do is we can substitute that H is equal to 250 over pi R squared into that equation where the H is. Okay, so let's do it. It is 2 pi R squared. That doesn't change. Then I have the 2 pi R, and I want to multiply that by H, but I'm replacing the H with the 250 over pi R squared. And yes, there is some cancelling. A pi on the top and a pi on the bottom will cancel out. An r on the top and an r squared, I can cancel one of those off, on the bottom. So that will all simplify down to be 2 pi r squared plus, now the 2 at the front of that pi r, that I still have that, I have to multiply this with the 250, so that makes the 500 on the top, and all that's left on the bottom is one of these little r's. So there's the 500 over r, and success, we got the right equation. So many Woo. Yes. Okay. All right. So all we have done is find the equation to this point. Okay, it took us two steps to get the equation that we needed. Now part C says, show that r is equal to 5 over pi to the power of a third gives the global minimum of s, the surface area, in the domain where r is greater than zero. So if we're trying to find a global minimum, I need to differentiate. So s dash, actually, before I, yes, before I differentiate, let's come back up to here one more time and rewrite that in a way that is easy to differentiate. So instead of having 500 over r, I would change that to be 500 r to the power of negative one. Don't want to differentiate when there's an r on the bottom of a fraction. Okay, so here we go, s dash, which would also be ds over dr. Just keep that in mind, because I do use that kind of notation a lot. To differentiate, it's the r that we're treating like the x here. So the power of the r is the 2, it will come down and multiply with that 2, so it become 4 pi. The pi is just a constant, so don't worry about it, it just stays in there. And r to the power of 1, because I've taken 1 off the power. Then for the second term, the negative 1 will multiply with the 500 to give negative 500 r to the power of, subtract 1, negative 2. Good. Now, to find maximums and minimums, I need my derivative to be equal to zero. So, this is going to take a little bit of room here, people, so I'm going to try and save myself some steps here. I'm probably going to have to write on the right-hand side here as well, so keep it small. I'm going to move this negative part across the other side to make it positive straight away, imagining that equal to zero. So, that is 4 pi r is equal to the 500 r to the minus 2, or 500 over r squared. If I'm trying to solve this for r, I need all the r's collected up. So I'm going to multiply my r squared across to here. It would be 4 pi r cubed equals 500. Then the r cubed by itself would be 500 over the 4 pi. Just dividing this 4 pi underneath my 500 here. The 500 divided by 4 
actually simplifies. What's 500 divided by 4? Yep, good. So that's 125 over pi, which means if I need to find r, I need to do a cubed root of that fraction. Cubed root of 125 five. is 5. And the cubed root of pi is either with a cubed root or a cubed root is the same as a power of a third. And we got our value for r. However, however, even though we only got one value and we really, really, really hope that it's the minimum, because if it's not, we're really stuck because we don't have a backup because we need the minimum value, we still have to show that it's a minimum by using the second derivative or our table. Secondary. Okay, you always have to justify. Second derivative this time, okay. All right, to help out, because I'm going to be subbing this in, as a decimal, that value for R is approximately 3.41, if that makes it easy to sub into your calculator in a minute. Okay, so let's go to our second derivative. So this will be S double dash equals. So from here, we're differentiating the R. So there's only one R here, so that's going to differentiate to 4 pi. Then the second term, the minus 2, will multiply with the minus 500 to be a positive 1,000 r to the power of negative 3. Good. Doing good with the minus signs. Well done. A lot of people accidentally go up when they're negative numbers. I'm glad that you guys aren't doing that. Well done. Okay, so I want to sub in to my second derivative the r value, which will probably be easier to put the decimal in at this stage. Just because we don't, we don't need to keep this exact, we just need to know whether the first derivative is positive or negative. So that's why I did the decimal part, because it would be much faster for you to type that into your calculator. So my second derivative is equal to 4 pi plus 1,000, and then it would be 3.41 to the power of negative 3. And you should get approximately 37.7 when you type that in. So because that is greater than zero, that means greater than zero means concave up, which means that that is a minimum point, which we going, yes, it worked. Okay, so therefore, minimum. So we could say that we have found, oh, I could write a little conclusion down there. Do you have any room left for a little conclusion? Yes? Um, it is actually a, a parabola. Our surface area was a parabola. If you come back and look up here at this equation, that equation, if you're looking at just the r's, here's my r squared and here's an r, there's no constant. So it is a parabola. And that means that if I'm finding that minimum point, it is going to be not just a minimum, it will be a global minimum because it will just keep going up forever on either side of that from there. Okay, so that's just what I was going to write down as a conclusion since, I'll write it down for those of you who have room, since the equation for surface area is a parabola or is a concave up parabola even, r equals 5 over pi to the power of a third is a global minimum. Still not the end of the question. Part D. Show that to minimize the surface area of the can, the diameter of its base should be equal to its height. So we have found a value for R that is the minimum. We now want to know what the height would be that goes along with that. So we're going to take our R value, which was R equals 5 over pi to the power of a third, and we want to put that in to find H. Remember way, way back at part A. Here you go, I'll scroll up for you. 
There's part A, H is equal to 250 over pi R squared. So if I want to know H, I know the R, I just have to sub that in here, the R value that I found. And if we can keep it exact, well, we need to keep it exact. So H is equal to 250 over pi to the power, sorry, pi R squared. That was the original equation. Then I'm going to sub into that 250 over pi. That's the easy part. Because I'm dividing by an R squared and R is a fraction, it will probably be easier to do your extra fraction that you're dividing by over on the side. So I'm going to go divide by my radius, which was 5 over pi to the third squared. So I'm trying to keep this exact here. If I need to square that bracket, I square the top and the bottom. So I'm also going to change it to a times at the same time and turn it upside down. Okay, so turn the divide into a times. Squaring this, if I square pi to the power of one third, what do I get? Pi to the power of? Two thirds. Two thirds. Pi to the power of two thirds over 25. So I've got to square the 5 as well. Now, some simplifying. 25 here, div 250, sorry, divided by 25 makes 10. Good. So 10 will be the number that is left from there. And pi, a whole pi here, or pi to the power of 1, and pi to the power of 2 thirds. If I cancelled off the two-thirds and took two-thirds off this, I would have pi to the power of one-third again on the bottom. Now, the goal was to show, it says there, show that the minimum surface area of the can is the diameter, the diameter of its base should be equal to the height. The radius was five over... Um, pi to the third, right? So if I was to times that by two, I get the 10 over r to the third. So what I've actually got there is two lots of the radius, otherwise known as a diameter, because two lots of a radius going the whole way across is the diameter of that cylinder. So I have shown what it asked me here, the diameter of the base, so here's my diameter, is equal to the height. So height is equal to diameter. Oh, there it is. 2R is a diameter. Height equals diameter. And I'll write that. Therefore, minimum occurs when the diameter is equal to the height. Which is kind of cool. All right, are we having fun? Yeah. Let's try another one. That's why we need to do a few of these, because doing one or two of these is just not enough. Yeah. Uh, you've got to do lots. And I think they kind of get they kind of get fun after a little while. I know they're very daunting at first. They are, because they're very long processes. But once you get into that pattern of I make the equation, I differentiate the equation, I find maximums and minimums, and then often have to find a height or a radius or something, it's, it's the same procedure, just with a new situation each time. Okay, so let's try again. Question three. The cost in dollars per hour of running a boat depends on the speed, which we're using V, kilometers per hour of the boat, according to the formula, C equals 500 plus 40V plus 5V squared. So they have actually given me a formula to get me started although it's not the one that I need to differentiate. So part A says, show that the total cost of the trip for 100 kilometers, okay, so they're, they're putting a, a measurement on how long the trip is, is going to be given as T equals 50,000 over V plus 4,000 plus 500 V. Because the cost in dollars 
is based on the number of hours that we are traveling for. We need to know how much time we are traveling for to be able to use that equation. So do you remember this lovely little triangle? Speed is equal to distance over time. Physics or science, yes. If I am trying to find how much time, because the time is related to the cost here, the time is equal to, use the little triangle, you cover the D, the T, sorry, it is distance over speed. So distance over speed. What distance are we locking in here? We're told that we're traveling a distance of? Nobody knows. 100, good, I highlighted it. We're going 100 kilometers. The speed, we're not using the symbol S. We don't actually have a number, but we do have a letter that represents our speed where we're told to use? V. We're going to be using speed is equal to V. So our expression for the time taken is going to be 100 over V. So the total cost of my trip, so T was for total cost here, is going to be the cost of one hour, which is the formula that I've been given there, times by the amount of time that we're traveling for, which is 100 over V, right? So I know an equation for C, that was this one here, this is the cost of running the boat per hour, right? That's what it says, that's the cost for one hour. So I need to multiply, I'm gonna change the order here, I'm gonna put the 100 over V first, because the cost is that 500 plus 40V plus 5V squared, and I'm gonna to have to expand that out. So 500 plus 40V plus 5V squared. Is everyone still with me? Yes. Good, one person is. Knowing where this is going, I'm going to have to expand that so I can get this into a form that I can differentiate. So expand the brackets. 100 times 500 is going to be 50,000 on the top over V. For the second term, 100 times 40 is going to be 4,000, but the V here and the V on the bottom will cancel out. So it will just be a plus 4,000 for the middle one when you times it out. Then the last one, 100 times 5 is 500, but the V squared and the V on the bottom will cancel one of those out, so it'll just be a V on the end of that. Everyone okay with that? Multiplying it out? You, look like you actually saying no? Yeah. Oh, good. I thought you were shaking your head, like, no, I'm not okay with this. All right. Still going to change that. I don't want to have the V on the bottom when I differentiate it. So let's bring the V up, 50,000 V to the power of negative one, plus 4,000 plus 500 V. I could have changed the order there, put my constant on the end, but that's okay. All right, that's part A. Technically this line here, that line there, there was my answer. I just changed it here because I don't have to differentiate it as well. Okay, that one there was the answer to part A. Part B, what speed will minimize the total cost of the trip? So here we go again, finding minimums. So I differentiate. This time, let's use the long notation just because I do the lazy version too often. Let's do dt over dv. Um, differentiating, bring the negative one down the front would be negative 50,000 v to the power of Negative 2, good. The 4,000 is a constant. It goes away. 500V differentiates to be just a plus 500. Now I need my dt over dv, which is why we like the short method because it's painful to write. We need that to be equal to 0. So like I did last time, to save myself a little line here, I know that this is equal to 0. I'm going to move that across the other side. So it would become a positive 50,000 V to the negative two, or I can even change that to be over V squared. 
is equal to 500. We are solving this for V. So let's times the V up so it's not on the denominator. We have 50,000 equals 500 V squared. Divide the 500 away. We get V squared equals 100. And to get rid of the squared, we must square root. Technically, that would be plus or minus 10 kilometers per hour. But yes, since we have not been talking about any type of direction in this, we would disregard the negative solution, saying that our speed needs to be positive. So therefore, V is going to be equal to 10. And you could just write, since my velocity must be greater than zero, because we're not, we're not giving it a direction, which if we were doing vectors, yes, it could be negative, but we don't have to do that here. So parts, keep going, we need to keep going. We need to show that that is a minimum. How do I do that? Second derivative. Second derivative, okay. I'm gonna, no, no, I'll keep going with my notation. Second derivative, d squared t over dv squared. Second derivative, from here, minus two times with the minus 50,000 to be a positive 100,000. V to the power of negative three. Then if, or I should be asking you, what do I do from there? T zero. I sub in, not when t equals zero, when v equals 10, I'm subbing in my, my speed to see if it's a maximum or a minimum. So d squared t over dv squared will be 100,000 times 10 to the power of negative 3, which is 100. Okay? It's positive. That's what we're concerned about. It's positive, it's greater than zero, which means it is a minimum. Yay, it's a minimum. So the, therefore, a speed of 10 kilometers per hour will minimize, minimize cost. So if you're trying to use your petrol wisely, you would travel at 10 kilometers per hour. All right? Small break before we do the next one.